Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Mistress of the Damned. I am your Mistress Katrina. How are you doing today? Uh, if you're new here, welcome. Glad to see you. This is where we believe that all knowledge is worth having and knowledge can be found in books. And if you believe that and if you're not sure what to read next, watch this channel. I am reading through my enormous library of books and then I review them. I give you a quick synopsis, kind of tell you what I think about them. So if you like books, just aren't sure what to read next, hit that subscribe button, like and share my videos, let me know what you think in the comments. And chaos ensues downstairs. This week's book hit my radar off a fee.org article wherein the author discusses Rachel Carson and the disaster that followed the release of her book, Silent Spring. And he discusses that in detail in this week's book, which is Pandora's Lab, right here. Seven Stories of Science Gone Wrong by Dr. Paul A. Offit. So of course, having been intrigued by the article, I bought the book and promptly placed it on my bookshelf as part of my monument to capitalism, also known as my personal library. And then I started this channel and said, hey, I have reason to pull that book off the shelf now and actually read it. So here we are. Now, the fun thing about this book is it reads like a novel, right? It's not often that you see somebody who has this highly academic background who is able to write in such an easy to read and engaging style, which just makes it a lot of fun and completely horrifying. It turns out once science goes wrong, it goes really, really, really wrong. The first thing covered is man's oldest painkillers, um, which I knew about because I, you know, read books, a lot of them. And I knew opium poppies were old because some creaky memory in the back of my head knows that poppies are referenced in the Odyssey because when at some point Vaguely, I remember Odysseus and his men ending up in a poppy field, Morpheus, right? That's about as far as that memory goes. I'd probably have to reread the Odyssey to actually pull out the details of it. But I remembered reading that, which means they were at least as old as, as ancient, Greek, uh, ancient Greece. But turns out that opium poppies are even older. They go all the way back to ancient Sumeria. My fuck, who knew? I didn't know that, but Dr. Offit knew that, and so he shared that knowledge. Now, I knew from poppies we got opium, and I knew from opium we got morphine. I, I knew these breakdowns had occurred, I knew, and from morphine we got heroin, and that's kind of where my knowledge of opium stopped. I knew that each level was seen as less evil, less evil, and, but what I didn't know is that from heroin we get the most addictive legal drug currently available, oxycodone. I did not know that each of these attempts, each of these metamorphoses of the opium plant were essentially attempts to render it safe as a pain relieving medication by removing the addictive properties. Uh, clearly this has failed as the opium poppy and all substance, subsequent derivations remain incredibly addictive. Now, I do want to point out here that there are a lot of species of, of uh, poppies out there. There's, you know, you can in fact buy poppies to sell, like poppy seeds in garden supply stores and plant poppies. The state flower of California, I think is the golden poppy. Uh, there is nothing illegal about any of these. The opium poppy is a very specific species of the plant. So you can go online and buy poppy seeds and grow poppies and not have a visit from the DEA. That's probably an important side note because I don't want people thinking, oh my God, my neighbor's growing poppies. He must be, you know, a heroin addict. Unlikely. <laughs> Most likely he just likes poppies and is growing them because he likes them. Now, the next story that Dr. Offit goes over is the story of margarine. Now, I think most people are aware by now that trans fats are good. There's a, t are, I'm sorry, are bad. They're not good. Don't eat trans fats. There's a ton of established literature on the dangers of trans fats, but Dr. Offit explains in easy terms what exactly trans fats are. He includes little diagrams so you kind of have an idea how they differ from plant-based and animal-based fats and exactly why they are so bad for you. Functionally, the amount of trans fats that it is healthy to consume is 0%, right? zero percent. Do you know how hard it is to find zero percent trans fats in foods? And let me explain why, because this is really important. This is something that I, I'm like trying not to go into too big a detail in sections of this book for, for reasons that I'm going to explain at the end of, of my synopsis here. But trans fats, the FDA <laughs> basically says that 
you can consume up to two grams of trans fats per day and it will be fine. Now that is not a whole lot. Two grams is a really minuscule amount, but, and this is the really, really important part that people don't know about. If a given foodstuff has trans fats that are less than 0.5 grams per day, then the label can legally read zero trans fats. So Dr. Offit points out it is all too easy to surpass your two grams of trans fats per day while eating foods labeled zero trans fats. And what he says, and this is a direct quote, the key to avoiding the problem of hidden trans fats is to look for the phrase partially hydrogenated vegetable oil on the nutrition label. If it has that on there, that means there are trans fats present in the food. I'm not generally one of those people who's like, read the labels, always read the labels. You should read the labels of everything. And if you can't pronounce it because, and that's stupid because there's a lot of words I can't pronounce. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad for me, right? Partially hydrogenated vegetable oil is a fancy way of saying trans fat. So if a label has that and it says zero trans fat, that means there's less than 0.5 grams, not zero. It's a sneaky FDA allowance. But this is something that you need to be responsible for your own health because overconsumption of trans fats, meaning more than those two grams per day, puts you at a higher risk of heart disease. So seriously, that's a big step. The next chapter surprised me. And this is like from here, like I was like, oh, opium, okay, know about opium and ooh, margarine, I know about margarine. And then kind of from here, the book starts to go downhill. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that it, you know, got boring or anything. I mean that it became progressively more horrifying with each chapter. The invention of ammonia. Now, this seems like a good thing. He actually goes into great detail on why ammonia is a useful product to have. It was designed as a breakthrough technology for farmers, and it really, really was, because it helps to replenish nitrogen levels in the soil, which means that more crops can be grown. So everybody likes food, everybody likes to eat, and this was a huge breakthrough. And the inventor of that, who was, oh, please tell me I put his name in here. Oh didn't. Crap. One moment. Fritz Haber. There you go. Fritz Haber was the inventor of ammonia and he won a Nobel Prize for it and rightly so because his, his invention allowed farmers to replenish the soil and grow more crops allowing more people to be fed which meant more people survived. Less people were dying of hunger and that's a good thing. Fritz Haber was German he was born in 1868 and he was German to the core. All right. He had that proud nationalism, which when World War I broke out because he was a proud German, he then used his skills in chemistry to create chemical warfare, essentially. Mustard gas and all, I mean, all the nasty trench warfare, chemical warfare gases that were used in World War I were his invention, um, basically piggybacking off of his ammonia success. In a really, really dark chapter, we find out later that this base of chemistry, he, be, he was the inventor of Zyklon, which of course was the basis for Zyklon B, which became very famous during Nazi death camps, right? Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for the inventor of ammonia. Oh, I did have it in there. Fritz Haber, who was of Jewish descent, right? Jewish descent. There it is. So he invented Zyklon. He was this big hero during World War I for his invention of chemical warfare. But when Hitler rose to power, he was cast out because he was of Jewish descent. Now he himself had converted to Protestantism, but that does not matter in Nazi Germany. What matters is the Jewish part of your heritage. I think it said he died of a heart attack. And that's pretty sad, right? I mean, he he died before he knew what exactly his invention was used for, and I'm not sure if that's a blessing for him or if his name just gets even more cursed for, for not knowing what he did. Anyways, darker and darker from here. The next chap cover chapter covered eugenics. Now, for those of you who don't know, eugenics is where scientists basically twisted the genetics as explained by Gregor Mendel. I think most people, at least in my, in my generation, kids, we learned about the um, genetic mixing of P's, right? A, A, B, B, and you get that little graph thing, and this is how you get recessive traits. Well, some scientists took that to an extreme and thought that this could be used to breed out genetic deficiencies in humans, thus creating the master race. Now, 
we all think of that phrase, the master race, as being tied with Nazi Germany. Well, that was an American invention. So go team, right? Yay, America, for coming up with the shittiest ideology of the 20th century. We use that ideology to legally and forcibly sterilize some 60,000 people with the blessings of the courts because they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna breed out the genetic deficiencies in the United States. And they certainly meant people who had things like Down syndrome, but they also meant people with criminal tendencies, which there is no such thing as a criminal tendency, okay? That's very much a nurture part of the growing up versus the nature, but they thought it was all nature. The nurture had nothing to do with it, hence eugenics. And this was taken to the logical extreme in Nazi Germany. The, uh, the only good news is that after the liberation of the camps in Poland and Germany, eugenics died an instant and immediate death here in the United States. And it became just verboten. Nobody believed in eugenics after they saw what Germany had done. So, hey, we learned something. Not enough, because next up was lobotomies. Yeah, lobotomies, right? I think virtually no horror show, you know, in, in the last 50 years has not included lobotomies at some point. And it had basically no backing in science. It was a crackpot theory. What it did have was a flashy doctor who was determined to make a name for himself, which he did in big, splashy waves, claiming wild success in treatments of basically everything. Uh, he, he, but he actually cured nothing. I mean, literally nothing. Basically, he made things worse. Like people who may have been a bit manic or hyper basically became semi-comatose zombies. I mean, what do you expect when somebody literally shoves an ice pick into your eyeball and then scrambles your brains around? I mean, it was not a pretty thing. Basically without anesthesia also. So, you know, they'd use electroshock treatment to jolt you for a moment so they could stick an ice pick in your eyeball. I mean, it was just like ooh, reading through, right? But he claimed wild success despite no success ever being actually attained. Now this one, huge sections of the medical community did in fact decry it but this is where the media stepped in and was like this is a miracle cure so i have a healthy distrust for the media anyways and that distrust actually goes all the way back to eugenics but the lobotomies they just kind of kicked it up a notch We're like this is the next best thing this is going to cure everything from depression to menopause and it did not cure anything from depression to menopause anyways that was a horrifying chapter the next one was just tragic. The next one was where he talked about DDT and Rachel Carson. Now, for those of you who don't know, DDT is a highly effective and largely innocuous bug killer, all right? And it was used very widely, I believe, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s to, to kill mosquitoes. And as a result, malaria the type of malaria that kills was actually made extinct here in the United States. I mean, there, there were functionally zero cases of malaria in the United States as a result of kill, FDDT killing off the mosquitoes that carry malaria. And then Rachel Carson's Silent Spring came out and DDT was named as the bad guy in this. Now, he points out not all bad things came from this because we are more environmentally aware now and there is that's a good thing, being environmentally aware and wanting to make sure that we don't completely wreck the planet. My camera's doing something weird. Okay, we're gonna see if we can finish out this video without the camera doing the weird thing again. Anyways, where was I? Functionally zero cases of malaria. Her, de her uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring came out and this is from the article referenced above and it's pretty much a nightmarish chapter in this book. DDT ended up being banned and the EPA banned it and what's really sick and this is where I'm like okay yeah this is why I don't trust the government all right. The EPA Environmental Protection Agency was created by the president who was the president in the late 60s was it Johnson is I John yeah it had to have been Johnson when this book came out Maybe it was Nixon, I don't know. I'm sure I'll learn about them in a few years. The president at the time created the EPA to deal with this pending environmental catastrophe as a result of DDT that was killing everything in its path. The hearings 
that went into whether or not DDT should be banned included hundreds of experts. The testimony is 9,000 pages, all right? It's an enormous report detailing all the things that prove that DDT was not harmful at all, that everything in her book was completely spurious and there was nothing in there that made any logical sense. But what happened is the EPA, the guy who was in charge of it, and I'm sure the name is in the book, but I don't remember it. He followed political pressure. The media, fucking media, who don't do their jobs for shit, they just go after the big story with absolutely zero uh, thought behind it, said DDT was the bad guy. So he had this 9,000 page report showing that no, there is literally nothing wrong with DDT. This is all smoke and mirrors, right? She, she was writing a book to create a bestseller, not actually doing anything for the environment. And you got the media going, eh, DDT is bad. People, we gotta do something. The government must do something. Hey, for the record, the government must never do anything. It's not their job, okay? But the government must do something. And so the government, in the form of this unelected bureaucrat, banned DDT. And then exerted political pressure on the rest of the world to ban DDT. And as a result of this, hundreds of millions in Africa poorest of continents died of malaria because they were no longer allowed to spray the bug killer that made malaria functionally extinct. So fuck you do-gooders, mind your own goddamn business. Maybe some people actually want to watch their kids grow to adulthood. That's my cynicism for the day. The last of the seven chapters was a series of stories of what happens when experts get blinded by their own hype. Oh gee. <clears throat> media and they get it in their heads that they're awesome because they're brilliant and they jump off the deep end. Linus Pauling was a chemist, brilliant chemist, who won several Nobel Prizes for describing chemical bonds. He discovered exactly what happens with sickle cell disease, determined the structures of protein. Then in his 60s, while searching for the fountain of youth, Pauling determined that high doses we're talking like 40, 50 times the daily recommended allowances of vitamin C were the cure for everything. Turns out this is grossly incorrect. High doses of vitamin, of any vitamin, not just vitamin C, but any vitamin, increase your risk for cancer. All sorts of cancer. There were multiple studies proving this, uh, and he never believed it. But he was pretty sure he was going to live forever with his high doses of vitamin C. He did not. Turns out you die anyways because death is a part of life. But he was pretty sure that that happened. He wrote books, released books, and this became a thing, and cancer rates skyrocketed because the experts said it was fine. You really are responsible for your own health, guys. One of the other chapter covers, one of the other ones covered his book were some spectacular blunders in the early AIDS epidemics from specialists in virus viruses who refused to believe the data. So, you I mean, you gotta wonder if their refusal to believe the data had more to do with their nurture upbringing, right? There's that, there's that, there's that eugenics again, nurture versus nature. So instead of following the science, they, believe, they, they believed what they wanted to believe and pushed a lot of bullshit hype and again, hundreds of thousands died. Now, each chapter ends with an important lesson that can be learned from the stories and the chapters in regards to science and when science goes so very horribly wrong as we have seen. I thought about including the lessons in relation to the stories as told, but I, before I review the book, I reach out to each author and let them know that I'm gonna be reviewing the book and then I take quotes from the books and I post them on my other social media, my, my Instagram account. So I want to make sure that they're okay with that. And Dr. Offit responded and said that <laughs> this book has become a favorite among high school science teachers. And so now I'm worried that if I reveal the lessons, kind of like I, I didn't want to tell the, the secrets from last week's book because then you won't read the book. And now I'm like, well, if I reveal the lessons, will the high school kiddies even read the book or will they just go look for the Cliff Notes version? So I'm not going to reveal the lessons it, well, because really you should read the book. Uh, it's completely fascinating. It's very accessible, which you don't necessarily expect from a doctor. You expect lots of big words and weighty science writing. And this was like a horror story page turner that I couldn't put down. I think I read it in like two days. And the lessons give you food for thought and put an interesting perspective 
on the events of this last year. Uh, especially the last lesson. Sorry, I, I can't help myself. I got to go over this. Pay attention to the little man behind the curtains. So read the book. Think about it, right? Um, science can go horribly wrong, but it's also how humanity reacts to that science that creates half the problems, more than half in some cases. Um, so thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. And remember, all knowledge is worth having. See you next week. Bye.